Now, Ms. Diagardi. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership in uh, holding this hearing, and also you and Congressman Lantos for introducing House Resolution 24, support uh, the United States recognition of Kosovo's independence now. I think in, in order to address Kosovo's current economic and political status and U.S. foreign policy in the region, looking at final status in particular, we have to talk a little bit about the history for the last two decades of our administration. And with all due respect to Ambassador Burns, I cannot share his pride in the 20 years of activity on the part, or I should say perhaps inactivity on the part of the administration. As Congressman Dana Rohrbacher said earlier, uh, we're a little late. It's very good what's happening now in terms of returning to the issue of the Balkans. But when we talk about pride, I think we have to talk about the House International Relations Committee. The House International Relations Committee can be proud because it has consistently responded to the conflict in the Southeast Europe in the last century, in the current century. Um, consistently supported aspirations for freedom and democracy on the part of peoples in the region who suffered from almost 50 years of communism and in the case of Albanians from racism and genocide. If you go back 18 years when this really began, the initiative in the House, it was Congressman uh, Lantos and then Congressman Diaguardi that introduced with 57 colleagues H. Conrad's 162 which ex exposed the egregious abuse of human rights of Kosovo's Al Albanians and called for justice. Now, unfortunately, at that time, the State Department, under pressure from former colleagues and American friends of, of Slobodan Milosevic, who had worked in the region, opposed every initiative by um, the House. And ultimately, Congressman Lantos and Diaguardi prevailed in getting a hearing. But what we see from 1989 on, after Milosevic um, invades and occupies Kosovo, we see a pattern that continued for a decade, and the consequences were really quite terrible. I mean, Vukovar gets attacked, House opposes it, the International Relations Committee opposes it, the administration doesn't act. Uh, Kosovo is occupied brutally, House opposes, Congressman Lantos introduces another res resolution, um, the administration doesn't act. Bosnia is attacked. Concentration camps were concealed. Five members of our State Department resign in opposition. Nothing happens. The only time there was an exception was when President George Herbert Walker Bush announced his Christmas warning in 1993, warning Slobodan Milosevic that if you start to move in on, on Kosovo in a military way, if you wage war, then you're going to be in trouble. There'll be dire consequences. But for the most part, state has just you know, embraced a policy of, of appeasement and containment. And then in February of 98, the Christmas morning was violated. And the Serbian military and paramilitary troops attacked Kosovo, raped, pillaged, and murdered their way across the country. So that by the time the United States was forced to lead NATO airstrikes against Serbia in March 99, Serbian military and paramilitary forces had killed more than 300,000 men, women, and children in Bosnia, at least 10,000 in Kosovo. Uh, a couple thousand are still missing and had displaced more than 4 million people in Southeast Europe. Now, there was a short period of time from March until June of 99 when the airstrikes were being conducted. The Congress and the administration came together at that point and realized they were going to have to bring down Milosevic and his henchmen. And the American people broadly supported the government in that, especially as they saw Albanians being herded in cattle cars to the border and thrown into um, camps. However, when the war came to an end with the capitulation of Milosevic, the United States agreed to defer any decision regarding Kosovo's final status. And what you see at that point is a reemergence of the State Department's embrace of its historical Belgrade-centric attitude. And I think that the evidence, though, of the past six years is that delaying final status has been a mistake. And it's time for the administration to look at House Resolution 24 as the blueprint for going forward. The worst thing that's happened, I think, in the post-war period is that reactionary forces in Belgrade and in Washington have succeeded, and we heard some of this today in part, succeeded in creating in the international media 
and in the minds of some of our government officials that there is a false parity between the perpetrators of state-sponsored terrorism and the Albanian and Bosnian victims of genocide, between the perpetrators and some individual Albanians who retaliated against individual Serbs. And so in this period, we see that the sovereign state of Serbia has been able to miscast Albanians of the Balkans as the source of violence in the region. And one of the reasons they've been able to do it, and my colleagues, um, Bishop Sobi in particular, um, spoke about this, they've been able to portray as, uh, Bos uh, Albanians as Muslims in the heart of Europe. And in a post-9-11 world, world, they've gone further and said, well, these Muslims are a potentially terrorist force in the heart of Europe. It's easy to convince Westerners of this who are largely untutored in the realities of Eastern Europe. So Belgrade's efforts to portray Kosovar Albanians as unworthy of their right to freedom then came to a culmination with the tragic events of March uh, 2004. I won't go into that. Other members of this panel already have. I only want to say two things. 19 people died, yes, but 11 of those 19 were Albanians. Eight were Serbs. And um, it, you know, it's a tragedy, but it wasn't orchestrated. And in my opinion, the world should be surprised not that there was any violence in, in Kosovo in six years, but that there's been so little with 70 percent of the population under the age of 30, uh, more than 60 percent unemployed. In the post-war period, and notably after March 2004, it again has only been the House International Relations Committee that grasped the danger of delaying Kosovo's final status and keeping it on life support. And as we all know, you and Congressman Lantos introduced House Resolution uh, 28, then 24, and you did it, in my opinion, and I think it's important for people to realize this, not just because you're interested in respecting the dignity of, of Kosovars and the human rights of all peoples. You also did it, and this is what our administration has to know, because you realized it was in the vital interest of the United States. And I'll just make, I'll summarize my testimony totally. Vital interest not to create a seeming contradiction between calling for free and fair elections and democracy in Iraq and Ukraine, on the one hand, and then denying the democratic process in Kosovo, something about which Congressman Rohrabacher has spoken so eloquently. It's in the vital interest of the United States to have a progressive Muslim Albanian majority in the heart of Europe. It's in the vital interest of the United States that Albanians are the most pro-American, pro-Western ethnic group in Southeast Europe and maybe in all of Europe. When America was attacked on 9-11, many countries danced in the streets while Kosovar Albanians lit candles, had it vigils, and said, we are with you. It's in the vital interest of the United States to provide genuine support for the democratization of all societies emerging from communism and ultranationalism. And this means that it must come to grips with the fact that U.S. policy in the past 15 years has failed to denazify and democratize Serbia. It's not enough simply to pick up Mladic and Karadzic to come to grips with the situation in which Serbia continues to be a quasi-mafia state that destabilizes its neighbors, and Serbs are being hurt by that. They have historically. I know there are improvements, but there are a lot of Serbs that have been held hostage, along with the Kosovar Serbs. And my last statement would be that it is the Kosovar Serbs that need to be at the negotiating table in the fall with Kosovar Albanians, not Belgrade. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mrs. Diaguardi. Mr. Rohrbacher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Joe and Shirley Diaguardi for the hard work that they put out on, uh, on this issue and this cause uh, over the years. And Thank it's uh, been vitally important that a mm -hmm. A group of people in, in desperate situations uh, in another part of the world uh, were given direction uh, on how to state their case and how to make sure people understood what was going on uh, through the very complicated democratic process in the United States. So I think Joe and Shirley have done a tremendous job in making sure that uh, we got the picture of what was going on instead of a blurred picture of what was going on there.